to saw this here. I want to remind everybody, Pastor had a bunch of these printed out, that scarlet thread that he was talking about. Uh, definitely come and check this out. It's very interesting stuff. See that scarlet thread through the scriptures there. Uh, it's very interesting. The whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, is basically the story of a line. And that's a wonderful thing. We see the preservation of a line there so that we can have the Messiah, the King of the Jews, so that we can have Jesus Christ, God manifest in flesh. And what a wonderful gift that is. All right. I'm glad to be with you all this morning. And uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. And we'll read a little bit here and then get into our study. <clears throat> 1 Kings 17 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We are humbled by the fact that you are so gracious to us. God, I thank you that you have provided for us. Lord, we are a people of means. Father, even the person that is the least in a country such as this is one of the greatest in the whole world in comparison to what other people deal with. Lord, let us not forget your benefits, your blessings, and help us to be a people that is about blessing uh, others, Lord, as you have shown compassion, that we show compassion, you've given us forgiveness, that we may give forgiveness, mercy to mercy, and love to love, and all of these things, God. Let us be a people that is about your business. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Moses, Abraham, David, and Elijah are the most frequently mentioned Old Testament figures in the New Testament. And uh, Elijah being the fourth. Mo Moses, of course, is the lawgiver. Abraham is the father of the faithful. David is the king. And Elijah is the prophet of God, first prophet of God. And he comes on the scene after a succession of wicked kings. And Proverbs 29 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And from Jeroboam to Omri, you had wicked king after wicked king after wicked king. And Omri is the father of Ahab. And let's just look back a little bit at the lineage, at the um, legacy that Ahab was coming from. Chapter number 16 and verse 25. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. I mean... If there's something that can be said about you, that's not what you want to be said about you, that you did worse than everybody that came before you. What a serious thing. What a serious accusation. What a serious statement the Bible makes here. And so Ahab has got competition that has been laid behind him, and he is going to come along and do his best to continue on with this wicked reign over Israel. There's almost a storehouse of iniquity that's being laid up in Israel, it seems. They had incorporated the worship of Balaam and, and all of this, uh, the worship of false gods, and they've done so many other wicked things. They've forsaken the commandments of God. And so God sees fit to send them the prophet Elijah. And we know that whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. And so this message, this text, this lesson this morning is, a, is, is designed, it's, I've designed it in a way to give you hope because we're going to see in here how we can find ourselves in a bit of despair even when we're walking faithfully and walking in obedience. We often stumble, we often 
uh, hit rocks. We often hit difficulties. And what do we find ourselves in? We find ourselves in despair. But there is hope in spite of the things that we encounter. And we'll see that this morning. And we know that Elijah led a life uh, that we can learn from, as Romans 15 tells us. These things are written for our learning. We know that he led a life that we can learn from. Uh, we look at Job in the Old Testament. Uh, you look at Job and you say, well, there's somebody that nobody can be like today. That's not true. Why, why do you think nobody can be like Job? You think there's no upright man that eschew evil? You think there's no men that are faithful to God? You think that there's nobody who is in prayer and interceding for others? You think, I mean, do you think that there, what do you think the church is here for? You look at a man like Elijah. Now, I know we don't have, uh, we don't have people being raised from the dead and things like that, but Elijah is a man, the Bible says, James says, a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and it rained. You look at Elijah, and you say, well, man, that's just, that's not, that's, that's just a, uh, what, what would you say? That's just some kind of a type there. It's, it's not really anything that we can attain to. It's just some kind of a, a perfect picture of a man that we can't be like. That's not the case, friends. We can be like Elijah. We can be like Job. We can be like David. We can, we can be men and women after God's own heart. We can, we can be friends of God. You say, well, that's just a little difficult. Well, that don't mean that we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean that we, not, we should not try and be, mimic the, the righteous deeds of those that have come before we don't do it for glory of our own name. We do it for the glory of God. We do it that others might see our good deeds and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Now, Elijah, Elijah is a remarkable man whose life is marked by obedience and service to God. Uh, by faith, he prophesies to Ahab, and by faith, he goes to the brook um, uh, Cherith uh, as God directs him, and he's fed there and watered according to God's word. Brook gives him water, uh, the fowl of the air, the ravens bring him bread and, and, and meat, and so uh, he is fed and he is watered. And uh, he starts his ministry with just 25 words, and from there he goes immediately into silence for three and a half years. I, wa I want to examine his life, and let's, let's get a little bit of encouragement from the life of Elijah. He starts his ministry with just 25 words, and then he goes to be alone. And one of the most profound questions that I've ever heard asked of a young preacher who's announcing his call to preach, uh, the question was, can you be alone? Can you be alone? Can you be alone with God? Or do you always have to have racket and noise of the world? Can you be alone? Can you sit in silence? Not, not can you stay away from the bar, not can you stay away from the, um, the street corner. Not can you stay away from this sin or that sin. But can you actually just be alone with God? Can you sit and meditate on God's word? Can you sit and pray? Can you sit and uh, can you fast? Can you seek God? Can you do that? Can you be alone? That's what Elijah was facing. And he would become a model for uh, prophets and preachers to come. He was set apart for three and a half years, and, um, and, and, and he, he is a life that is dedicated to God. I mean, how many of us would pick up and just haul away and leave just to get alone with God? Not to go be with anybody else, but just to be alone with God. I would imagine that I would have a difficult time with that, frankly, because I like people. Even though we're all so messed up, I really like y'all. I mean, I do. There are two kinds of people. There's people who get exhausted from being around other people. They don't hate them. They don't dislike them. They just get tired. Just other people drain them. And there's other people who get energy from other people. And I, I'm one of those. I get energy from other people. And uh, God's gifted me with the gift of gab, I guess you could say. And so I enjoy talking with people and getting to know people and learning about them. And, and, and anyways, 
I won't go off into all that. But um, I would have a difficult time with that. Some of you all would just be happy. Some of you all would go build a cabin in the woods and stay there for the next 20 years and it wouldn't bother you. But could you be alone for God's sake? That's what Elijah did. And everybody wants the power of the prophets, but not the problem of the prophets. I heard a man of God say this. They want the testimony, but not the trouble and temptation. They want the ministry, but not the, uh, the mess. They want the charisma, but they don't possess the character. A life of a prophet is one set apart. And that's what Cherith means. Cherith is a, it's a set apart place. It's, it's, it means cut off. It means set aside. And that's what Elijah's life was. It was a life that was cut off. It was set aside for a service to God. I imagine that is the way for many of our brothers and sisters over the Internet. They feel that way. They feel like they're cut off, that they're separated. But you don't have to be cut off and separated. I'm talking to you all on the Internet now. You don't have to be cut off and separated in misery. You can be cut off and separated and be watered and fed of God. And you can rejoice in that. Now, I know it's discouraging when you're alone at work. Some of you all, um, many of you all work jobs, right? And you work with a bunch of lost people and you're alone at work. Some of you don't have a saved person within a stone's throw from you. You could shout for days and you wouldn't walk across somebody who's born again. Oh, sure, you, you meet nominal Christians, culturally, cultural Christians, uh, people who are, uh, well, my daddy was an Episcopalian and my mother was this and, and, I was, and, and I went to church when I was a kid and, yeah, I've heard the Bible and, yeah, Jesus is good and all. But, but you don't, they don't, they're not sold out for God. They're not living for God. They're not born again. They don't love the Lord. They don't love his word. I remember working at the hospital and I'd sit there and talk with people and they'd say, man, do you ever shut up about the Bible? I'm not bragging on myself. I just, like I said earlier, I just run my mouth. So I'm going to run my mouth about whatever I'm thinking about. And I was thinking about the Bible a lot. And they said, golly, can you just set it down? You know who told me that? A preacher. A pastor, nonetheless, of a Nazarene church. Can you ever just put the word of God? Can you ever just stop talking about this? He's like, I do this for a living, man. I don't want to hear about it 24-7. That's a pa He was a pastor of a church, and that was his response. That don't make me any better than him. That just makes me in better position with God than him. <laughs> Come to find out he was lost. He got saved. About three years after that, he got married and then he got born again. Praise God for that. I rejoice in that. That's a testimony of what our pulpits are filled with, though. Men who, this is the career, this is the job, this is the paycheck, this is not the burning passion of their heart. This is not what they weep over at night, praying over their messages, asking God to help them to proclaim his word faithfully. They just want to get up and give you a nice story, get a couple of laughs out of you. They want to help you to feel better about your, your week and, and about your mistakes. And yeah, you can feel better about your mistakes and you can have a good week and you have a good laugh when the preacher's up here. That's not a problem. But if their goal is just to entertain you, they're not doing the work of God. They want the power, but they don't want the problems. They want the testimony, but not the trouble. They want the ministry, but not the mess. They want the charisma, but they don't have the character. We need people who have a life that's set apart for God. Your life ought to be lived for the glory of God. Not just the preacher or the teacher, but every one of us from the front pew to the back, from the middle to the left to the right. Every last one of us ought to live a life that glorifies God. And some of us think we do, but then... I would imagine that if you started working with somebody that you go to church with, you'd you'd realize real quick and fast just how much you don't live a life glorifying to God sometimes. Amen? Sometimes we find ourselves in serious positions of faltering and stumbling and foolishness. We don't recognize it when we're the only light in the workplace or we're the only light in that situation. 
But when you got another light shining next to you and you kind of can see that light and you can say, oh, I'm looking pretty dim today. Some of us would count it a benefit that we're not working with a bunch of saved people. The word of God is a powerful thing and we are feeble men declaring a powerful message. And often those messages come home to roost. And this is where we get to the heart of the matter of the text and of the lesson today. And this is, this is what I hope to be able to do to help you. The question is, what do you do when those trials, when those problems come home to roost, when those stumblings come to you, when you fall in a pit, when you fall in a ditch? Where do you go? Where do you flee to? Where do you run to? Can you get along with God in that time? Can you, can you thirst for God as a deer panteth after the water? Or do you just run straight back to the world? Do you run back to the old things that satisfy? Say, well, I've already messed up, so I might as well enjoy myself for a minute before Sunday comes around, and then I can do my little bit of praying, and, and then I can, I can be all right with God again. That sounds very Catholic, but that's the way a lot of Baptists act. I mean, that sounds like Catholic. We're going to go to Mass and get everything straight, and we're going to do our confessions, and then we go back out and we can mess up again. We'll come back and do our confessions. But that's the way we act sometimes, even Baptists. Independent fundamental, stalwarts of the faith, Baptists. But we pretend like church is the only place where we can get close to God. If church is the only place that you get close to God, you've got a problem between you and your relationship with God. Amen. If you can only come and get the excitement of the congregation, and that's the only thing that kind of builds you up so that you can give a, give a holy amen or, or give a shout, if, if that's the only thing that gets you excited, that can get you on, the, on your knees praying to God, if, if that's all you got, you're in trouble. You're in danger. This is a wonderful place. I love the church of the living God. I love being here with God's people. I love sitting here and, 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 and being ministered to and ministering to and, and rejoicing and praying and, 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 and helping each other. I love that. But if this is all you're living for is Sunday so that you can be close to God, you've got a problem. Where did Elijah go? I know you know this. I, I know that you're aware of where Elijah went, but let's just read a little bit so that we can refresh our memories. The Remarkable Life of Elijah, chapter 18 of 1 Kings and verse 17. Now, just a little preface before this. Um, Elijah had, the word of the Lord came to Elijah uh, in that third year, and he said, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Okay. So that's in the third year. He says, go show yourself to Ahab. I'll send rain upon the earth. And so Elijah goes, and Ahab had a governor of his house named Obadiah. And Ahab and Obadiah had, uh, had made an oath together that they're going to find Elijah. They're going to find that prophet. And they're going to talk with that prophet, whatever the case may be. And so Obadiah ends up running into Elijah. And Obadiah is a faithful man, it says, um, in verse 4, it says, Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave. These are prophets of the Lord when Jezebel was cutting, was, was killing the prophets of the Lord. She was cutting them off. She was, she was killing them. And so Obadiah takes and he hides an hundred prophets in a cave and he feeds them with bread and water, okay? He does the work of God there. And then he sees Elijah and he's scared to death because he's like, we've been looking for you and we just assumed you was gone. And you were done for. And now you're here. And he's afraid because Elijah tells him to go tell Ahab um, uh, that, that, he's going, that, that he, it's going to rain. And, and he's, he's afraid. He's like, if I go there and you're not here with me, then he's going to kill me. And he's terrified. Well, Elijah says, I'm going to be there this day. I will surely shew myself unto him today, he says in verse 15. And Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. In verse 17, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? <clears throat> what a question. What a question to ask of Elijah. 
Now, who prayed that the rain would stop? Elijah. But why did he pray that the rain would stop? Because of the wickedness of the people. Because of the wickedness of the kings. So, isn't that, the, isn't that what sinners do? Isn't that what we do when we get cornered and we're, and we're feeling defensive? Some of you argue with your wives. I know that most of you are holier than me and you don't argue with your wives. Sometimes you argue with your wife and you immediately just shift blame. Or your wife's arguing with you and she shifts blame. And all of a sudden you're arguing about things that make no sense. Things that have nothing to do with what you were originally talking. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all never talked to your spouse. If you ever talk to your wife or your husband, you know what I'm talking about. But if you don't talk, then you don't know. Because these are just what happen. We're people. We're foolish. We're frail. We're stupid sometimes. Mostly the men, but sometimes the women. I'm glad nobody threw anything there. And so he shifts the blame. That's what sinners do. They shift the blame. Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. Elijah is bold and confident. Now, if he was not bold in, in his faith toward God and in his service and obedience toward God, what do you think his answer would have been? Well, hold on. I mean, let me, let's explain this a little bit. Now, here's what I was trying to do. Is I prayed to God because, you know, the situation... No. No, he wasn't trying to weasel his way in there and trying to convince Ahab. He said, no. I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore sin and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel. So here he accuses, he confronts Ahab and the sins he has committed, and the sins he is pulling the people in to commit. Remember that when the wicked um, bear authority, when, when, the, when the wicked bear rule, what happens? The people mourn. So the people are following this. Now, not everybody. We know that there's 7,000 reserved who have not bowed the knee to, nail, uh, to Baal, right? There's 7,000 who have not kissed. There's 7,000 who have not been tarnished with that worship. They have continued to serve God faithfully. But in Elijah's mind, it's, it's all the people. It's all the people. That's called the Elijah syndrome, right? But he is bold as a lion as he confronts the king, the man who had all authority in the land and who could put him to death at his very word. All you have to do is say, somebody kill Elijah, and they're going to go kill Elijah. If you don't believe me, you need to read 1 Kings chapter 1 on, and you'll see that the kings were very, uh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say they were very happy, but they were very... Uh, uh, okay with the idea of saying, go slay this man. That man got slayed. Go kill him and bury him. And they got killed and buried. That's what happened. Avenging innocent blood, Solomon does. Uh, in all kinds of situations there in the text. And so in spite of the fact that the king could have Elijah put to death, Elijah so bold as a lion and faithful and obedient to God, and he confronts Ahab. So what do we have here in verse 19? We have... Uh, what has been called the trial of the false gods. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So I have sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Notice how bold and passionate and convinced Elijah is of his service to God. How faithful he is. How he is just, I mean, he's roaring in there like a young lion. There are many times in our lives when God opens doors and gives us opportunities for service. And one of the most dangerous things is for us to take that opportunity for service. Yet it's one of the most rewarding. Why is it dangerous? Because when you serve God, when you put yourself out there and you serve God and you stand for God, you open yourself to attack. He's not attacking you if you're just coming to church flippantly and it's just what you do because culturally you're behaving such a way. He's not attacking you if you just kind of like say, 
you know, like you're, you're one of those coexist people. Um, I like the, the bumper sticker that they made in, you know, that says contradict and it shows all the little symbols of the religions, right? That's more accurate. You know, it's, it's not, you know, if you're one of those people, though, who just thinks, like, let's just all get along. You're Joel Osteen religion. Love your cat, love your dog, love your neighbor, love your friends, love your family, and everything will be all right, and make sure you give me $500 every week. Every, your life's going to be wonderful, and you'll be a millionaire. I promise you, you give me 500 every week, you, that kind of religion. That kind of just, like, mamby pamby garbage religion is what I call it. It's worthless, doesn't amount to anything. It's trash. It's, it's useless. Elijah, in contrast, is bold as a lion. And when you are bold as a lion, you open yourself up to attack. Satan is not harassing Joel Osteen over his mansion. He's not going after Todd White for claiming false miracles. He's not going after Benny Hinn for claiming false miracles and begging for money. He's not going after Kenneth Copeland for buying another jet, even though he's got an airport and a, a personal airport and a hangar full of jets. He's not going after Jesse Duplantis or any of these other name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it garbage preachers. He's going after people who are faithful to God. Amen. And I hate to discourage you, but I'm just going to let you know that it's, it's generally not him. It's, it's his his. His, uh, his demons. Those who are bothering you. Satan ain't got time for you. You're small beans. Some of y'all think you're big shots, but you're not. It's, it's probably just some of, the, some of those uh, principalities and powers of the air that are spiritual wickedness and high places you're dealing with. You ain't dealing with the devil. He's got bigger fish to fry. But here's the thing. When you're faithful, you're going to come against adversity. And here, note this. Those of you that preach or teach, you know this. Uh, and even those who don't preach or teach, you know this. When you make a stand for God, immediately opportunities come to fall. Immediately after you make a stand for God, you want to preach about uh, the sufferings of Job and how Job was faithful, and all of a sudden sufferings will fall all over you. You want to preach about... Um, uh, Man, you shouldn't be like Jonah. You should be, you should be faithful to God. You shouldn't flee like Jonah. Immediately an opportunity to flee presents itself. You see, all these different things that you, that you think about, that you teach about, that you preach about, for those of you that do that, and that you believe if you're faithful and you trust the Word of God, you see those things, and when you hold to those things, all of a sudden you realize opportunities come to fall just the way that you saw that somebody in Scripture fell. That's what Paul's talking about. These things are written for our learning. That we through patience, right? And comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Here's the comfort of the scriptures. That in spite of those failings, in spite of the falling, we have hope in God. We can trust in God. He's a forgiving God. He's a compassionate God. He's a loving God. He cares for us. Elijah, though, he's facing this. He's bold as a lion. Let's look at it. I just want to read this because I think that maybe we haven't read this uh, recently. Some of you might have, but maybe you're not in 1 Kings right now, and you just haven't looked at Elijah in just a little while. And let's look at it real quick. And Elijah came unto all the people, and he said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. That's kind of like the preacher who gets up here and he's preaching his guts out and his lungs are laying on the front pew. And he's just waiting on somebody to say amen and everybody's there dead silent. Now some people, that's their way. Pastor talks about it. You go to some, you go to some internet places and you see that country and the preaching there and the people are just dead silent. But you go to an independent Baptist church and you expect somebody to shout sometime. Maybe it's just because their foot got stepped on, but somebody's going to raise their voice. Maybe it's a kid who gets whacked in the back of the head. Somebody's going to make a noise, right? But there's a, you know, imagine that. You're sitting there and you're proclaiming the word of God and you're confronting people and the whole, the whole audience is dead silent. That's what Elijah faced there. And so he just came along and hit him again. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. 
Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put it put put no fire under and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire let him be God and all the people answered and said it is well spoken Now were these the people who were faithful were these the 7000 reserved no these are those who are following after Baal now, maybe some of that 7,000 are there, but I would imagine that most of these people are the people that he's rebuking, the ones that are following after Baal. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture to say that they don't give a hill of beans whether or not uh, Baal answers or God answers. They're just there for the show. They're just there for the show because they know how the prophets of Baal act, but they're also curious about Elijah. How does this prophet behave? How does this prophet act? And so we see they take and they, uh, they dress the bullock. Uh, they call on the na name of Baal from morning until noon, it says in verse 26, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon. Finally, Elijah had heard enough of this garbage. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. He mocked them. There's such a thing as a righteous mockery, and you're about to read it right now. Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or a pair adventure. He sleepeth and must be awake. And what did they do? They said, well, maybe, maybe he's got a good point there. So they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Note this. The time of the offering was when? Evening. When did they start? In the morning. They knew they were going to have to work it up really good. I mean, that's how these, uh, that's how these false prophets and these false preachers and false teachers, that's how they are. You come into the service, man, they got the lights going, they got the fog machine going, they've got everything going, right? Everything's lit, everything's exciting, they got the rock band up there, and they're playing, uh, they're playing ACDC or Def Leppard or Bon Jon Bovi or whatever. And, and they're all excited, and they play about 40 songs. They get you all excited. They get you lulled into kind of a passive state through all of the worship. Right? They make a big to-do about it. It's a huge, drawn-out thing. That's what the prophets of Baal did. From morning until evening offering. Sacrifice. And Elijah said unto all the people, in verse 30, Come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Here's Elijah's preparation. No exciting jumping up and down, no screaming and yelling, no crying aloud, no cutting himself. Here's what he does. He repairs the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Right? And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And they did that three times. Three times they fill barrels with water and they pour it on the, burnt sacri or on the sacrifice and on the wood. And then they fill the trench. Elijah is outside of his mind if he thinks that's going to catch on fire. I don't know how many of y'all try to start a fire with wet wood, but it ain't happening. That's what all these people have got to be thinking. There's no way. He has just messed up. Now, Baal didn't answer, but obviously we know that Elijah's God is not going to answer because he already soaked everything. And there's just water all around the, the offering there, all around the altar there. There's no way. That's what they've all got to be thinking. But with curiosity, they continue to look on. And what happens? 
And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Notice that. He repaired the altar, did 12 stones. He prepared the sacrifice. He cut it and he laid it out. And then they, did, they poured the water on it. While everybody else is trying to fan the flames in these false uh, churches and these, these, uh, these worship centers and these concert halls, they're all trying to fan the flames. He's dousing it with water. He's pouring water. He's, he's, he's just like a wet blanket on the situation. He makes it a, a, a situation in which you, you'd be a little bit discouraged about whether or not you're going to see any fire here. But so on, it's at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Now he just told them, you all think that what, I'm done is, what I've done is crazy, that I've wet the sacrifice in the wood, and that I've, I've filled a trench with water. You think that I'm out of my mind, but that's God's word. And there's going to be times in your life when you do things that other people look at, and they say, that person is out of their mind, but that's God's work in your life. Amen. You might say, what does that look like? When you take evil for your good deed and you forgive it and you walk away from that i don't have the text in my mind right now but there's text in the new testament that says uh, what does it profit if you uh, have a situation where somebody offends you and you were doing what was wrong and, and 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 you have good character in that situation it's better that even you have good character in the situation if somebody offends you and you were doing what was right it's not how do you react when somebody accuses you of something and, and you were actually doing something wrong. It's how do you react when somebody accuses you of something and you were doing something right. Do you have the right spirit about you? Or are you just bulldozing over them? Husbands? Wives? Is that how you treat your marriage? When you do something wrong and, it, and it's really not your fault, are you ready to, to throw down the gauntlet to, to make sure that they know that you were right? Or are you ready to take wrong for righteousness sake, for, for goodness sake, for peace's sake? Elijah here tells them what he's about, what God had told him to do. In verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord thy God, the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Elijah just prophesied there. What did he tell the people? Your heart is being turned back to God now. He said, All this God told me. This is what God told me, and he told me your heart is being turned back to him now, even in this moment. As you see all of this wild stuff that I'm doing, your heart even now is being turned back to God. You're saying, will we now see the miracles of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kish Kishon and slew them there. Bold as a lion. Bold as a lion. Friend, are you bold as a lion in your service to God? Do you have an opportunity for service and you're bold as a lion? That's how you ought to be. We ought not to be cowardly. We ought not to be fearful. But it's okay if you are. Paul said that he came unto uh, those, what was it, at Corinth in fear and trembling. Right? He was trembling. But yet, in spite of all his trembling, he was not, what does he say? He forsook not to proclaim unto them, the whole counsel of God, right? He, he just says it all. He puts it all out there. It doesn't matter if he's scared. He puts it all out there. And even though inside he is full of fear and trembling, on the outside he is bold as a lion. They fell on their face and he slew the prophets. And then Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. He's saying, do you hear the thunder off in the distance? Do you hear that lightning crashing? 
There's a sound of abundance of rain. Now he said that before he even prayed. Note that. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servants, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Repair thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. But he prayed and it stopped the rain. And he prayed and it rained again. Now you won't perform the miracles of Elijah, I don't believe. I don't believe that you're going to perform the same exact miracles of Elijah, but I believe that you can touch heaven. I believe that you pray unto God and the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I believe that you can reach God's heart. I think as Brother Rick Owens said recently, or maybe it was Pastor, one of the two said uh, very astutely, very wonderfully, <laughs> you want somebody to pray for you, ask a child. Because they got no guile in them. Ask a child, they got no guile in them. When will we go to God and pray like that? That's what we need to do. But here's the thing. Immediately after Elijah's surface, service to God, his boldness comes the trial. He had just set on trial the God uh, 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 Baal, the prophets of Baal, the trial of the false god, right? And now comes his trial. Friend, I want to I encourage you, do not be discouraged by what I'm about to say. And say, well, I don't want to deal with that, so I'm not going to go and try and serve God as fervently. You ought to passionately serve God no matter what, the, what may come. What difficulties may arise. We ought to be passionate about our service to God. Are you, are you seeking out people to tell about Jesus? Are you looking for people to minister to? Are you asking God for doors to be open so that you can give the gospel? Are you saying, God, just give me one opportunity with this family member. Just please, one more opportunity to share the gospel with them. One more opportunity with this co-worker. One more opportunity here, Lord. I mean, what do you pray about? Do you pray about your bills? Do you pray about getting a better house? Do you pray about making sure the car is paid off? Do you pray about making sure the mortgage is paid? You, I mean, you pray about all that. Do you pray about opportunities for service? Do you pray about God opening doors so that you can be a faithful minister? We're ministers of reconciliation. So many of us are too focused on our world and what's going on around us. We don't think about the broader things. Elijah then faces his trial. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And Jezebel's mad and she sends a message to Elijah. And Elijah goes off and he sits under a juniper tree. Why does he do that? What happened to the boldness of Elijah? Now somebody's threatened his life and he's afraid. He went to the king and said, you're the problem. The one who could absolutely slay him in a moment. And he said, you're the problem, King Ahab. But now Jezebel, that Jezebel sends a messenger and says she's going to kill him. And he believes her. And now he's scared. Now he's worried. Now he's petrified. But, but, but he is strengthened how? Now he goes under that juniper tree, but where does he find? He finds an angel coming along and ministering to him. Friend, don't be discouraged by the trials that will come after your bold service to God. Some of you are trying to be bold in your service to God as a father. Don't be afraid of the trials that will come in, in, in that. Some of you are trying to be ser uh, uh, servants of God in your boldness as a mother. Don't be afraid of, your, of the trials that will come because of that. Some of you are trying to be bold in your service at work and, and in your service here and there in all kinds of different ways, in ministering and, and, and witnessing and, and whatever may come. Don't be afraid of the trials that will follow that. 
Be of good courage because there's a ministering spirit that comes along. And, and we have the Holy Ghost that ministers on our behalf. And when we can't even pray the words, He says them to the Lord. He brings our petitions. We have Jesus Christ ministering on our behalf. Friend, I want to encourage you be bold as a lion in your ministry and your obedience to God and your service to God. I want you to take this week, and we're going to close with this. I want you to take this week, and if you aren't already doing this, I want you to, I want you to do this. I encourage you. I implore you. I tell you, this will be a great benefit for you. Read your Bible every day. Read your Bible at least once every day. You dedicate time to TV, I bet. You dedicate, dedicate time to the Facebook and to the Twitter and to the YouTube. You dedicate time to all kinds of things. You can open your Bible. Okay? Open your Bible this week. Number two, make sure you're praying every day. Some of you go days without praying. Some of you have days, and you'll, you'll bless the food, but I mean, I mean getting alone with God. I don't mean just saying a, a little quick prayer over a meal just to make sure you don't look like a heathen to those that are around you. I mean getting alone with God. I don't mean bowing your head while you're at a restaurant so that people look over and say, oh, that's a Christian. There are church-going people. We're in the South. What do you expect? I mean get along with God. And number three, when you pray, pray for an opportunity for service. Pray for an effectual door to be opened. God will give you one. And don't fear the trials that follow. They will come. But there is sweet blessings in serving God. Elijah inevitably realized that. Elijah had a remarkable life. And he's a life that we can mimic, that we can see in our own. And I want to encourage us to try that this week. Number one, pray. Number two, read that Bible. And number three, ask God for an opportunity for service. Will you do that this week with me as I do it as well? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would bless it now. We know that you will according to your will. Father, give these people boldness in their service towards you. Give me boldness. God, don't let me be weak in the faith, but let me be strong. Not so that anybody can say anything good about us, but God, that they can rejoice in your good deeds that you have performed through us. For we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Let us walk therein. We ask it now in Christ's precious name. Amen.